Section 6. The form of Christianity set forth by you, among other things, has this, that we should strive with all our powers, have recourse to the remedy of repentance, and in all ways try to gain the mercy of God, without which neither human will nor endeavor is effectual. Also, that no one should despair of pardon from a God by nature most merciful. These statements of yours are without Christ, without the Spirit, and more cold than ice, so that the beauty of your eloquence is really deformed by them. Perhaps a fear of the popes and those tyrants extorted them from you, their miserable vassal, lest you should appear to them a perfect atheist. But what they assert is this, that there is ability in us, that there is a striving with all our powers, that there is mercy in God, that there are ways of gaining that mercy, that there is a God, by nature just, and most merciful, etc. But if a man does not know what these powers are, what they can do, or in what they are to be passive, what their efficacy, or what their inefficacy is, what can such an one do? What will you set him about doing? It is irreligious, curious, and superfluous, you say, to wish to know whether our own will does anything in those things which pertain unto eternal salvation, or whether it is wholly passive under the work of grace. But here you say the contrary, that it is Christian piety to strive with all the powers, and that without the mercy of God the will is ineffective. Here you plainly assert that the will does something in those things which pertain unto eternal salvation, when you speak of it as striving, and again you assert that it is passive when you say that without the mercy of God it is ineffective, though at the same time you do not define how far that doing and being passive is to be understood, thus designedly keeping us in ignorance how far the mercy of God extends and how far our own will extends, what our own will is to do in that which you enjoin and what the mercy of God is to do. Thus that prudence of yours carries you along by which you are resolved to hold with neither side and to escape safely through Scylla and Charybdis, in order that when you come into the open sea and find yourself overwhelmed and confounded by the waves, you may have it in your power to assert all that you now deny and deny all that you now assert. The Necessity of Knowing God and His Power Section 7 but I will set your theology before your eyes by a few similitudes. What if anyone intending to compose a poem or an oration should never think about nor inquire into his abilities what he could do and what he could not do, nor what the subject undertaken required, and should utterly disregard that precept of Horace, what the shoulders can sustain and what they must sink under, but should precipitately dash upon the undertaking and think thus, I must strive to get the work done, to inquire whether the learning I have, the eloquence I have, the force of genius I have be equal to it, is curious and superfluous. Or, if anyone desiring to have a plentiful crop from his land should not be so curious as to take the superfluous care of examining the nature of the soil, as Virgil, curiously and in vain, teaches in his Georgics, but should rush on at once thinking of nothing but the work, and plough the seashore, and cast in the seed wherever the soil was turned up, whether sand or mud. Or if anyone about to make war, and desiring a glorious victory, or intending to render any other service to the state, should not be so curious as to deliberate upon what it was in his power to do, whether the treasury could furnish money, whether the soldiers were fit, whether any opportunity offered, and should pay no regard whatever to that of the historian, before you act there must be deliberation, and when you have deliberated speedy execution, but should rush forward with his eyes blinded and his ears stopped, only exclaiming, War! War! and should be determined on the undertaking. What, I ask you, Erasmus, would you think of such poets, such husbandmen, such generals, and such heads of affairs? I will add also that of the gospel, if any one going to build a tower sits not down first and counts the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, what does Christ say of such an one? Luke chapter 14 verse 28 to 32 Thus you also enjoin us works only, 
but you forbid us to examine, weigh, and know first our ability, what we can do and what we cannot do, as being curious, superfluous, and irreligious. Thus, while with your overcautious prudence you pretend to detest temerity and make a show of sobriety, you go so far that you even teach the greatest of all temerity. For although the sophists are rash and mad in reality, while they pursue their curious inquiries, yet their sin is less enormous than yours, for you even teach and enjoin men to be mad and to rush on with temerity. And to make your madness still greater, you persuade us that this temerity is the most exalted in Christian piety, sobriety, religious gravity, and even salvation. And you assert that if we exercise it not, we are irreligious, curious, and vain, although you are so great an enemy to assertions. Thus, in steering clear of Charybdis, you have with excellent grace escaped Scylla also. But into this state you are driven by your confidence in your own talents. You believe that you can, by your eloquence, so impose upon the understandings of all that no one shall discover the design which you secretly hug in your heart and what you aim at in all those your pliant writings. But God is not mocked. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 Upon whom it is not safe to run. Moreover, had you enjoined us this temerity in composing poems, in preparing for fruits, in conducting wars or other undertakings, or in building houses, although it would have been intolerable, especially in so great a man, yet you might have been deserving of some pardon, at least from Christians, for they pay no regard to these temporal things. But when you enjoin Christians themselves to become rash workers, and charge them not to be curious about what they can do and what they cannot do, in obtaining eternal salvation, this, evidently and in reality, is the sin unpardonable. For while they know not what or how much they can do, they will not know what to do. And if they know not what to do, they cannot repent when they do wrong. And impenitence is the unpardonable sin, and to this does that moderate and sceptical theology of yours lead us. Therefore it is not irreligious, curious, or superfluous, but essentially wholesome and necessary for a Christian to know whether or not the will does anything in those things which pertain unto salvation. Nay, let me tell you, this is the very hinge upon which our discussion turns. It is the very heart of our subject. For our object is this, to inquire what free will can do, in what it is passive, and how it stands with reference to the grace of God. If we know nothing of these things, we shall know nothing whatever of Christian matters, and shall be far behind all people upon the earth. He that does not feel this, let him confess that he is no Christian. And he that despises and laughs at it, let him know that he is the Christian's greatest enemy. For if I know not how much I can do myself, how far my ability extends, and what I can do Godwards, I shall be equally uncertain and ignorant how much God is to do, how far his ability is to extend, and what he is to do toward me, whereas it is God that worketh all in all. First book of Corinthians chapter 12 verse 6. But if I know not the distinction between our working and the power of God, I know not God himself. And if I know not God, I cannot worship him, praise him, give him thanks, nor serve him. For I shall not know how much I ought to ascribe unto myself, and how much unto God. It is necessary, therefore, to hold the most certain distinction between the power of God and our power, the working of God and our working, if we would live in his fear. Hence, you see, this point forms another part of the whole sum of Christianity, on which depends, and in which is at stake, the knowledge of ourselves and the knowledge and glory of God. Wherefore, friend Erasmus, your calling the knowledge of this point irreligious, curious, and vain is not to be born in you. We owe much to you, but we owe all to the fear of God. Nay, you yourself, See that all our good is to be ascribed unto God, and you assert that in your form of Christianity. And in asserting this, you certainly at the same time assert also that the mercy of God alone does all things, and that our own will does nothing but is rather acted upon. 
and so it must be, otherwise the whole is not ascribed unto God. And yet immediately afterwards you say that to assert these things and to know them is irreligious, impious, and vain. But at this rate a mind which is unstable in itself and unsettled and inexperienced in the things of godliness cannot but talk. Section 8 Another part of the sum of Christianity is to know whether God foreknows anything by contingency or whether we do all things from necessity. This part also you make to be irreligious, curious, and vain, as all the wicked do. The devils and the damned also make it detestable and execrable. And you show your wisdom in keeping yourself clear from such questions wherever you can do it, but however you are but a very poor rhetorician and theologian, if you pretend to speak of free will without these essential parts of it. I will therefore act as a whetstone, and though no rhetorician myself, will tell a famed rhetorician what he ought to do. If then Quintilian, purposing to write on oratory, should say, In my judgment, all that superfluous nonsense about invention, arrangement, elocution, memory, pronunciation, need not be mentioned, it is enough to know that oratory is the art of speaking well. Would you not laugh at such a writer? But you act exactly like this, for pretending to write on free will, you first throw aside and cast away the grand substance and all the parts of the subject on which you undertake to write. Whereas it is impossible that you should know what free will is, unless you know what the human will does and what God does or foreknows. Do not your rhetoricians teach that he who undertakes to speak upon any subject ought first to show whether the thing exists, and then what it is, what its parts are, what is contrary to it, connected with it, and like unto it, etc.? But you rob that miserable subject in itself, free will, of all these things, and define no one question concerning it except this first, namely, whether it exists and even this with such arguments as we shall presently see. And so worthless a book on free will I never saw, excepting the elegance of the language. The sophists, in reality, at least argue upon this point better than you, though those of them who have attempted the subject of free will are no rhetoricians, for they define all the questions connected with it, whether it exists, what it does, and how it stands with reference to etc., although they do not effect what they attempt. In this book, therefore, I will push you and the sophists together until you shall define to me the power of free will and what it can do, and I hope I shall so push you, Christ willing, as to make you heartily repent that you ever published your diatribe.